and long. Right. It's okay if it with me if it's recorded. Over the long haul, and I'm talking about a thousand years or so, because the beginning of my structure of so the birth of these penal myths begins with the what some have called the legal revolution in the 12th century as Roman law, the rediscovery of Roman law sort of generates this tremendous uh, development of state institutions in the church and in the, in, in the territorial sovereign realms. But if we look at that long haul, the carceral state appears to grow, at least in the number of institutions. Obviously, in any particular state, you might see times when prison populations fluctuate, numbers of police or arrests fluctuate, et cetera. But if you kind of look at the long arc of the carceral state, with the exception of a few things like uh, scaffold execution, very few institutions disappear, many appear. All sharing this role in the exercise of the power to punish. And I would say by and large, at least in the American experience, the scale of it, at least in capacity, right? If you look at the number of penal institutions we have, number of courts, et cetera, over time, relentless growth with gaps, you know, moments of growth and then plateaus. Third observation, even in comparison with other governmental institutions, criminal justice institutions, and this may seem strange to say in the United States right at this moment, but we can come back to that, why is this different, seem to enjoy a legitimacy that is relatively robust and enduring relative to trends in, in crime or insecurity that are supposed to be their um, kind of metier. And obviously we're going through something of a aberration in that account right now, but that's it's an, maybe the exception that proves the rule. Now, all of this has the marks of what organizational sociologists have called rational myths. Why use the term rational next to myth? Uh, and, and by the way, you know, if you want to put on a different theoretical suit of armor, I think we could relate these as well uh, to what uh, Pierre Bourdieu calls doxa, you know, the deeply ingrained cultural beliefs that, that are sort of ex made explicable occasionally, but are basically preordained or pre-accepted by most of the rational cognitive processes that subjects go on in the society. Why call them rational myths? Because <clears throat> we all know of myths that there are myths in our societies that everybody sort of recognizes are myths in, in, in the sort of Greek, ancient Greek myth sense, but that tell us a story that provides a narrative that we recognize as important to our cultural context. The, in America, you know, Great Gatsby, right? The self-made millionaire, and I guess today billionaire, um, it, it is a kind of myth that um, I guess some people think it's empirically true that anybody can, you know, become the next Great Gatsby or the next um, uh, Mark Zuckerberg. I mean, not that they're the same. Uh, but the contrast is with rational myths are myths that are widely perceived to be accurate, right? And, it, it, and, and, and when on occasion, you know, brought up into consciousness are often asserted to be well-established or to be supported by contemporary experience, if not actual research. And here's the key finding from this, you know, broad literature, I, uh, you know, that has been very successful in a whole range of domains in trying to explain sort of organizational behavior. And the core finding is that organizations basically sustain their legitimacy by developing formal structures that is visible parts of their institutional makeup, branches, you know, divisions, services, ideologies that are properly aligned with the dominant myths that occupy their, broadly speaking, environment or domain. Now, just to give you an example of something that is quite different than the myths I'm going to be talking about, the idea that college education, you know, will make everybody a great person and, and better at whatever they're doing, you know, is a good example, right? So a lot of police agencies in the U.S., although far from all of them, have uh, established college 
degree requirements uh, or at least encouraged and supported college attainment as a, a ground for promotion for police officers. That would be an example of sort of you know, broad myth in our culture that's not uniquely associated with the criminal justice domain by any means, about which police or prisons or, 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 or courts, obviously, uh, or other organizations sustain their legitimacy in part by aligning themselves with those myths. Or, you know, my colleague Lauren Edelman has shown that, like, in the civil rights, post-civil rights era, having organizations that have offices that are dealing with uh, equal opportunity, right, anti-discrimination is something that's broadly accepted as the right thing to do in the culture. And therefore, if you're, you're an organization, you have an office of equal opportunity, you're more likely to be perceived as legitimate, you know, even if you're paying women and people of color less in objective terms. Um, and she has written a fabulous book about this process. Now, often, as I just gave in this example, the kind of myths that shape the criminal justice domain don't necessarily originate there. And you know, again, you can think of lots of examples of this training, professionalization, um, uh, oversight. You know, th these are all sort of mechanisms that have come to be seen as culturally very important to organizational legitimacy in many domains, and criminal justice institutions can adopt them and strengthen their legitimacy by doing so. But the myths I'm really interested in are ones that um, came from the institution of criminal justice itself. And, and one thing that in, new institutionalists have pointed out is that on occasion, when organizations are, become really important in their society, they can actually institutionalize some of their own core programmatic features or ideologies as a myth. And I think that's exactly uh, you know, what I've been interested in with the way that the carceral state in its you know, 1,000 year arc of expansion has institutionalized a series of myths about crime and punishment that make it very, very hard to delegitimize the carceral state. And you know, I'm sitting in reality in a place that where the legitimacy of the carceral state has been called into question recently more than in any time in my memory, except for maybe, you know, in the late 60s when I was a small child. Um, and, and yet, <laughs> you know, the debate in our presidential campaign is between one candidate who thinks that we need to reaffirm our total commitment to the police and maybe militarize them more, and another candidate that wants to invest billions in community policing. So again, you know, the, the, the power of these myths is, is very, very significant, I believe. So I'm going to focus on four myths. I mean, I've, I can't lengthen the book any longer. They're probably, <laughs> I have come up with a fifth one, which I, I'll, I'll mention. Uh, and I know you'll have other ones that you think should be on this list. Uh, but in a way, what my, it, since my argument is that following new institutionalist theory is that the institutionalization institutionalization of a myth is the outcome of a significant social process of trying to embed the power of a new institution or expand it. What I've attached these myths to are what I think should be familiar um, to most students of punishment in society as four noted transformational moments of criminal justice history, where new institutions have come into being. And I claim zero originality, you know, in my account of these are uh, these transformational moments <clears throat> or moments when this penal state sort of evolves new forms and reintegrates the old ones in, in, in a new way. And those of us that have, you know, been in the punishment society business for a while, We'll be familiar with most of these, so uh, I'm interested in, you know, to, to kind of take them in how we know them, you know, uh, the birth of the prison and the police uh, in, in the early 19th century, uh, studied by Foucault, by Malossi and Pabarini, by many, many others, Garland and others, um, Rothman in America, uh, 
is clearly a you know radical transformation <clears throat> comes with a whole set of new ideas about crime and punishment. Um, the progressive era in the U.S., uh, you know, the I guess you call it the Edwardian period in uh, the the U.K. Uh, that David Garland uh, wrote about so brilliantly in Punishment and Welfare, where you get you know an, a proliferation of new penal institutions on top of the prison and the police and the courts, probation, juvenile justice forms, probation, uh, parole. Um, more recently, mass incarceration in the U.S. and uh, a culture of control more broadly around the globe, if not totally mass incarceration, uh, which began arguably in the 70s. I throw into those three a fourth, which is the birth of the penal state itself, covered by Kantorovich in his The King's Two Bodies, by Harold Berman in his uh, book, Legal Revolutions. Uh, basically the establishment of public punishment, which is a, you know, it's a longer process, but begins in, arguably in the 12th century with the establishment of a public monopoly, at least a legitimate claim to be the monopoly over the power to punish. I call these arcs, and I think some of you have heard me talk about this before, for two sort of metaphoric reasons. One, because they play out over time the birth of the prison you know, can begin as early as the 1780s when Blackstone and Howard get the cold bath fields prison idea up and running in Great Britain, even though it's not the birth of a widespread prison movement at the time with still relying on transportation. But in 1860, you know, California's built, in 1850s, California's building a prison for the first time. Lima, Peru in the 1860s is doing the birth of the prison. So this moment in time plays out over a larger temporal landscape because of colonialism, trade, et cetera. But also because, and mainly through the myths I wanna talk about, these transformational moments don't just result in a new institution that then goes its own way, but they stay it's, it's, uh, attached to their myth in a way that means that lots of the meaning making that went along with the birth of those institutions continues in our own time. And I just to run through the four of them, I, I, I just ran through them uh, with you, uh, but just to re repeat them now in order of their birth. So with the 12th century, the establishment of sort of sovereignty and punishment as a duo, the idea of the disciplining of idle bodies uh, that goes along with the birth of the uh, prison and the police, the birth of what I call the eugenic institutions, uh, the idea that we can kind of control crime through controlling unfit populations and through various filtering mechanisms in the early 20th century, and then mass incarceration, which I relate on a broad kind of thematic of what kind of power is at stake uh, borrowing uh, 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 Soskin's idea of expulsion, that w the kind of logic of power in this period has been expelling populations. And in, in the US, that means expelling black and brown uh, peoples from the central cities uh, that they had come to be important parts of in the industrial area, but which era, but which they became viewed as a danger in the era of mass consumption and uh, sort of neoliberal accumulation. Now, I hope in time, um, and I want to talk about the myths in my last bit here, that the, this could contribute to a more systematic and empirical study of punitive turns across different societies. Um, and it's something that your colleague, uh, Leslie McCarrick, you know, called for a long ago in a classic Punishment Society article where she laid out a very promising framework. I'm not doing anything that general here. I just want to add a component to it, which is the importance of these myths. Um, and I hope it can contribute to a more sophisticated picture of punishment itself. Um, that is of punitiveness itself. We tend to treat punitiveness as a kind of populist impulse, uh, a kind of emotional heat uh, that gets generated for political and economic reasons, but that has sort of no intellectual content of its own. And I wanna argue that punitiveness, even though 
populism is a real thing, but that draws on real power of ideas in our culture. That is that when people are punitive, they're punitive, they may have bad reasons for being punitive, racism, colonialism, class, insecurity, et cetera. But they also have good reasons to be punitive. That is their culture has provided them with powerful arguments that punishment is good and makes everybody better off, society better off. And I'm just gonna run through these myths briefly um, because they're, again, I, my claim is that they're already well known. <laughs> So <laughs> if I have to explain them at great length, then uh, I've defeated my own argument, right? So myth one, the myth that goes along with the birth of the penal state itself, the constitution of public punishment, if you will, is what I call the myth of penal debt. And I know right now, sort of penal debt has become a term of art to describe the usually post actual punishment uh, legacies of criminal convictions like fees and fines. And, and we see this in Florida right now where after uh, passing an amendment that former felons were to be allowed to vote, the, the state legislature said, not until they paid all of their fees and fines and that got upheld ridiculously. But my claim is that um, this idea that you owe a debt to society that must be paid in the currency of punishment really goes back to theological uh, transformations that more or less parallel the, the rediscovery of Roman law and the transformation of the church and state. I attach it to Anselm of Canterbury, another is actually an Italian British intellectual who, who, uh, who was the Archbishop of Canterbury when he wrote a very important book called Cur, Cur, Cur Homo Dios, in which he basically argued that God as the sovereign of the divine space, like the sovereigns of the temporal space, could not forgive sin, at least not on a large scale, had to collect it in the form of suffering. And it wouldn't, wouldn't even be payment. And this is, I think, the most interesting uh, finding, right? We often point to the idea that somebody has, quote, paid their debt to society after they've been punished. And in America now, we're kind of shocked to discover that, wow, we, we're not letting them off. We keep charging them more. But St. Saint, Saint Anselm explains the reason for this, which is you can't pay the debt. Turns out that if the debt is to an ontologically higher being, God or the state, you actually can't pay it. You owed it. You owed compliance. Uh, and punishment is honoring the sovereign or God. Doesn't actually pay the debt, but the idea of debt remains. And my argument is that while we often invoke that image of paying your debt to society as a sort of pledge of leniency. In reality, it, it disguises a profound anxiety that we haven't charged enough, that we need more punishment, and that we have to make sure that we've exacted. You know, President Obama, while he released something like a thousand uh, uh, federal prisoners who had been sentenced to life for essentially drug delivery crimes, said it when he announced that that you know they owed a debt to society, but not life. You know, they've served 20, 25 years, so that's enough. That's a very high level of punishment, right? He, which he thought was adequate. Second myth, the myth that is most familiar to us, and I, it, it, uh, I, I give credit here, not, uh, not originally, but following Garland and others, to a Scot, which I'm pleased to do, uh, and that is Patrick Colquhoun. And it's the idea of that the core origin of criminality is the idleness of the poor. Not the idleness of the rich, mind you. I mean. They're idle for a reason, and they have moral virtues that allow them to handle idleness, but the poor can't handle it. And, you know, I don't have to tell this audience, if you're actually in Edinburgh, that, you know, Colquhoun is a brilliant thinker who's, you know, not a reactionary by any means. He doesn't even want to close pubs. He just wants to monitor and regulate them because he thinks they're actually a useful way to kind of keep an eye on the poor. But the basic idea here is that for idle property damage and possibly violence are near at hand, abated by institutions like the pub and gambling and, and uh, the many things that we have made the source of illegalities now for centuries. Um, and, and again, this is a very powerful idea that lasts up into our own time. Third myth, three, there you go, um, which is the myth that belongs to the era of eugenics. And it's the myth of degeneracy. And here again, um, I think Garland was a real uh, 
forerunner in insisting in punishment and welfare on the uh, centrality of eugenic ideas to the whole birth of that sort of Edwardian suite of institutions. Fascinatingly, even though the UK or Britain, whatever you call yourself these days, uh, invented eugenics in the form of Francis Galton and certainly believed in the kind of white supremacist ideas uh, and colonialist ideas behind eugenics, eugenics never had the same impact in, in Britain that it did in the US. And there's a whole political science literature about this. But in the US, it had unbelievable significance. I mean, the end of immigration from Europe, explicitly based on eugenics, prohibition, the end of alcohol sales, which required a constitutional amendment, explicitly based on eugenics, mass sterilization, explicitly based on eugenics and upheld by the US Supreme Court. The only thing, and, and the whole suite of criminal justice reforms, again, seen as the most legitimate way to accomplish the eugenic end of removing the unfit from society by punishing them or removing them into penal institutions. And of course, with the rise of the, with, with the end of World War II and, and the exposure of Nazi global crimes, eugenics fell out of favor. Uh, but little of this has changed. Let me invite you to Google Trump and eugenics. I mean, he gave a speech the other day in Minnesota in which he, he, he asked his audience of white Minnesotans uh, you know, to take pride in their genes and they have good genes. He has good genes because his parents are from Germany. Sound a little eugenic to you? So none of this has really gone away, but especially in criminal justice, what it really meant, the myth of degeneracy is that there are a core group of, we don't need to call them born criminals, but maybe they're just persistent offenders, but they're criminals and we can identify them and we can, uh, we can segregate them. And I would say it you know, lasts into our own time in ways that distance itself from uh, biology, but are still palpably connected to it. Finally, the myth of disorder, which is the myth of our time, and some we could still call it by its own birth name, which is the broken windows narrative. The idea that uh, uh, neighborhoods, if uh, allowed to tolerate disorder and minor criminality, will gravitate toward high crime neighborhoods, which at the time, in the 80s, when this myth began to be promoted, was already clearly understood to mean places where your rights mean nothing, right? Where criminals can kill you and where the police can kill you, right? So you want to do everything you can to stop your neighborhood from becoming a high crime neighborhood. And the myth of disorder was a way to think about how to do that. Now, <clears throat> I see that my time is already running brief, so I'm not going to reiterate um, the sort of structural arrangements between these myths and the sort of crises of the penal state and the capitalist state that led to each one. There is a broadly speaking Marxist account of the sort of political economic pressures on the state that lead to each myth, which I you know, outline in the paper, the introduction, which I claim no originality to at all, uh, and which I welcome criticisms of or alternatives. Um, I want to make a few claims about what I think these myths uh, can help us do in thinking about the comparative study of, of punishment in society. Um, if these myths travel, and I think they do, uh, undeniably they travel to some extent, but if they travel as extensively as I claim, along with the actual institutionalizations that they promoted, then I hope that this, if America is sort of the flagrant example of the worst case scenario, because we've absorbed the most extreme versions of each myth and have the most extreme kind of capitalist crises, right? Not just workers restive under early capitalism, but say slaves uh, under slavery, um, that the, the logic of these myths is more explicit here and therefore can, can help us identify these and provide a productive framework for comparative uh, uh, work. Um, even if this is too general and too simplistic for true comparative analysis, I hope it can, again, contribute to a more uh, complicated picture of punitive campaigns, punitive turns, punitiveness itself. And again, I don't claim here that this is sort of a complete model or that ideas, myths, generate punitive campaigns. I think punitive campaigns or punitive turns 
arise from powerful political economic conjunctural forces that essentially com compel the state to come up with new ways of addressing the vulnerabilities of capital at different key junctures in our history. Um, but I, so, so I think the political forces and the economic forces are always central, but once in place, my claim is that these punitive myths form a kind of, you know, tailwind behind any punitive campaign that comes along and a headwind against any effort to reduce or abolish. And we're seeing that already, right, in, in the US with calls to defund or abolish the police, immediate claims that that would lead to a re spiking of violent crime as gang members, eugenics, uh, uh, you know, began to do their thing. And there's already some quote empirical evidence that that homicides and maybe gang activity is up in the big cities because of police uh, demoralization over the defund uh, uh, movement. You know, there, there are signs that the myth of idleness is waning. After all, the war on drugs is, uh, you know, following prohibition was one of the classic penal ways of prosecuting a war on idleness. And today in Mar uh, here in marijuana, in California, I can, you know, arrange a delivery of legal marijuana, you know, to arrive just after this talk and I may need it by then. Um, maybe that's a sign that, you know, some of this productivist obsession with controlling people's idleness is waning. And yet politically, the idea that making people work is good way to stop them from committing crime remains powerful. There's been a whole scandal here recently of how many drug treatment programs which are court ordered in the United States, right? You get arrested for drug possession. You have to go into this drug treatment program. You know what the program consists of? You go to a warehouse and work for free, but that's gonna make you better. Again, these myths are, are you know, remain, I think uh, very, very powerful. And what they do is make it hard to argue that we should uh, do away with or even shrink very much our punitive institutions. Again, I, I think that the form of the myth that you have and its extremity make a difference. Eugenics is a good example, maybe the most testable of my examples because some countries really absorbed it. I would say mostly the, the Anglo settler colonial societies, Canada, Australia, the US, obviously uh, South Africa to the extent that it had that Anglo uh, twist to it. Uh, Germany and Italy during the fascist period with some sequelae into the modern period. Um, but many other countries uh, resisted uh, absorbing much of the eugenic story into their penal systems. Many of them absorbed it in other ways. So my, you know, just to close with a kind of rare empirical prediction, my claim would be that, you know, those societies most influenced by say eugenics would be the ones most prone to deeper, more extreme punitive turns. And that doesn't always need to take the form of a prison population, right? It could mean extreme punitiveness toward immigrants who are often seen in exactly the same terms uh, or you know, welfare recipients. What are the solutions? Uh, I had hoped originally in this book to sort of end with a, a set of kind of counter myths. I was gonna call them fables. Sounds a little softer than myths. Um, things like dignity and equality, autonomy um, that have been building up in the same Western legal systems that arguably these punitive myths have. I don't know, maybe it's just like the darkness of our current situation, but I, I, I'm finding myself less and less reassured by those fables. Uh, I think that punitiveness can sort of um, overcome them too regularly, too, too easily. To tell you the truth, my, my uh, and I, I think I addressed this in the paper, if you had a chance to look at it, my current optimism, if I have any, you know, lies with our current Black Lives Matter movement here in the US, which is by the way, the most, the largest social movement in terms of street protests that we've had maybe ever, but certainly since say the labor movement of the early 20th century. One of the reasons I'm so uh, moved by it is the, the leadership of uh, black people, particularly black 
queer women uh, who are sort of both the most vulnerable to criminal violence and to state violence in America and as part of a black population as a whole that has no reason and every counter reason to buy into the myths of the punitive state because so many, you know, all but the first apply almost exclusively to them in the US, the focus on idleness, the focus on degeneracy, the focus on uh, disorder tends to be anti-blackness all the way down. And the claim that we have to pay our debts to society never gets collected from white people in the eyes of uh, many of us. So I, I think the Black Lives Matter movement represents the most exciting thing I've seen in a long time that might destabilize these myths. But uh, you know, it would take a decade long movement of escalating force and maybe violence to accomplish that. So um, I don't know what to say about my predictions there. I think I'm gonna stop. I think I'm close to the 45 minute mark.